Hey friends of the internet, uh, welcome. Uh, I am here today with the one of the directors of Sweetheart Deal, a documentary that um, had one of its many screenings. I, I think you um, had a world premiere at the Seattle Film Festival. That's Um, right, yeah. yeah. Um, but this is a documentary about uh, four sex workers who were on Aurora Lane. Um, I don't know how many still live there um, that come to trust this man, uh, well, nicknamed Elliot. I think that's his nickname, right? I don't think that's his middle Mm name. -hmm. middle it's his middle name yeah he Okay. he he goes by many monikers <laughs> Yeah, so uh, without getting too into spoilers, uh, it's about that relationship. that these four women have and also just the nature of sex work on Aurora Avenue. Um, so to kick things off, um, this is, I always call these wine twirly questions, you know, like the who, what, when, where, why questions. I, I always feel like those are a bit wine twirly, but um, there's a clear direction where it's, I, I, I feel you, had an imperative to make this documentary. So what um, what did you and your other co-director, uh, Gabriel, um, how did you choose this documentary to make? Um, well, this has been a long ongoing project. So I originally didn't, you know, we didn't know what was going to end up, who we were going to end up focusing on. I knew that I had an interest in the area. I think um, the area, the area of Aurora Avenue, which has already changed quite a bit, um, since when the time that we started filming and <clears throat> really trying to find out what was kind of going on underneath the surface, but we didn't have an agenda as far as, um, social issues, subject, or even specific subject matter. We just knew that we wanted to tell a very human story and tell a story that, um, uh maybe is exploring a world that viewers <clears throat> would not otherwise have access to but maybe we knew all these things like we wanted people to be able to see themselves in someone else's struggle who was different than their own and connect and and also we knew about the style we knew about that we wanted to shoot this verite style um or can be called different things but we were trying to keep our voice out of it as much as you know we didn't we, we definitely didn't want anything like that like narration or anything like that and we really didn't want anybody thinking about the presence of the filmmakers more like you're experiencing a narrative film just as you know but it, it happens to be a documentary yeah yeah but that's all we really new <laughs> yeah. yeah and you know it, it 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 is a documentary in that classical sense um i think i mentioned this on I, I don't even remember anymore i've been through so many interviews during yeah. slam dance uh and actually did one for sundance for murder and bighorn uh if you oh, saw okay. that um both of the directors for that um but i appreciated that touch of just documenting because i think what has held a lot i i can't speak for everyone but one of my pet peeves i talked about this in one of my interviews was the documentarian inserting themselves where the where you can hear them ask a question and i'm like no i really just want to hear from the subjects what are they dealing with and you know you you focus on a lot um and you know w one of the things um was this cycle of drug abuse to uh, well i wouldn't call it abuse i would call it the use of drug as a medication uh for the pain is what i think a few people uh a few subjects uh refer to it as um could you i i guess comment a little bit on that of what you learned about that cycle so it's like i had an understanding of opioid and inherit heroin use at the time you know um a little bit before that but not that much and so first you know uh, one of the things that i was 
I didn't know was that at least at the time and in the that place most of the people were out there because of it's hard to say what came first the addiction or um you know getting into that um working on the streets and everything but um you know probably a lot of people are already aware of like the trajectory of you know you start off people start off taking you know uh heroin or fentanyl or whatever and then you know everything's great for a few weeks every you know there's uh or things are um you know you're not dealing with an addiction yet and then suddenly people wake up one day and um they have the worst flu of their lives and they don't know what it is. And it's that dope sickness. So a lot of the, um, the women that we were filming with, it's like their entire schedule of the day is built day and night is built around trying to avoid dope sickness is trying to avoid, um, because, you know, and of course, as long as that, the longer that goes, the harder it is to, um, you know, uh, in their case, you know, go out and work on the streets and everything like that. So they become, you know, they're becoming sicker and sicker. So it's like, it takes over, um, you know, so then it becomes trying to take, an, you know, get enough of the drug to just get back to normal, not even to get high uh, a lot of the time. It's just to get back to base. So they don't feel like horrible. I don't know if that's exactly what you were trying to get at, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, any answer would have worked, really. Uh, I, I just found it fascinating uh, how in-depth you go into it because there's this... Uh, one of one of the people you interview um, gets a job as a welder. Um, mm -hmm. and, Christine, um, yeah. Yeah, Christine, thank you. Um, and she... Seeing that whole process of getting her, you know... Uh, interview uh, drug test and everything like that was really interesting because um i don't want to go too i'm trying uh okay. to dodge around spoilers I, I, it's a documentary but still i yeah. feel kind of um but there's a incident at her uh welding job that gets her fired uh, mm -hmm. and she talks about oh I, I felt like i could do this but i was getting dope sick um, and I just wanted to feel right. all right, you know? Right. Yeah. Cause she goes, you know, she, she basically, she's so excited. She, she was so excited to go back to welding. She was so thrilled to go back to welding, but you know, you see that she's faking her drug test. She's using yeah. somebody else's urine and it's like, oh, you know, the next step is she's like, the next step is just going to be, um, you know, all I need to do is kick. Well, you know, uh, that's going to catch up with you, unfortunately. So she does end up, you know, getting the dope sickness takes over at work. And of course, as being a welder, that's a dangerous um, combination. So unfortunately, she ends up losing that job, which she, you know, it's not just a job. It's like her, you know, it's her identity. And so, uh, you know, at that point, so it was just very, difficult for her but I think you see how much people are trying you see how much they they want to find a way out but the hold of the the drug is um it's a difficult one to break um for sure and you know even if even after breaking the um physical hold then there's the the, the emotional part so yeah, that was, Christine is a fantastic person. She's one of my favorite people. So I just, um, I would, I wish, you know, in another lifetime, she could have, you know, like her family is very involved with like Mensa. She's, I mean, I she's like genius level IQ. She really is a brilliant woman that fell into, you know, some life circumstances that are unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and you you see her try to break it um, pretty early on, um, and it's I'll just say it, it it was horrifying because you get to see it firsthand. 
um, what the effects of being dope sick are actually like when she's recovering uh, in uh, Elliot's van. Oh, yeah, I think that's Krista. Everyone oh, has sorry. a lot of similar yeah. names. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, she's, she's known as a couple different names through the film. But yeah, that that was a that was a difficult, very difficult moment. And um, but felt like it it was important to include that as well. Um, so people yeah. can really, you know, have a better understanding of it. That That is a difficult scene. Yeah. Yeah. And we talk about these difficult things. Um, and I, I have to imagine you had to build some kind of just innate trust um, because you say you filmed this over years. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I'm just curious um, as to how I, it's a weird question, but um, how you built up that trust and how people how they felt comfortable with that the these yeah. very raw moments keep being captured right yeah well i think that um with this sort of very intense documentary i think that what you um the relationships that you make with the camera off are you know if you know are just as important or if possibly more important than what you're actually um capturing on camera so it's like a lot of the um, relationship building and stuff is done with with no camera present and with just um, really connecting with people and getting to know them and you know so um, you know spent many hours in hospital rooms and spending time together sharing a meal sometimes driving to methadone and and they also knew I think everyone knew that we wanted better things for them everyone knew that we wanted them to find the fulfillment that they wanted in life and to um you know break free from the hold of what you know the addiction but it's like that was that's definitely something that it has to be the person's time to decide that it's no one else can decide that for them or it's not even possible and we knew we didn't you know we didn't have the power to but they knew that we wanted good things for them. And we, you know, so we continue to, um, you know, I continue to have relationships with everyone. Um, and in Sarah's case, Sarah's family. So, um, because, um, well, people will see the film, but, um, so Sarah's parents and Sarah's daughter and, um, yeah. So those relationships are, are really important. Yeah. And, it's something that um, getting to Elliot um, that's easily exploited, I think, in his case. Um, he exploits their trust, uh, I'll just say. I'm trying to dodge and weave around. Um, but um, so I guess, can we talk a little bit about what happened with Elliot? Um, they're they're because it comes as the shock I, as i assumed to, to many of the girls it came as a shock um and as a viewer it's a shock too um so what was the did did that come mid-production can we talk a little bit about elliot the uh revelations of elliot elliot yeah, so he we had already been um, filming for quite a while when Elliot was. I mean, there's no way to really avoid. We might just mention that there's spoilers in this. Yeah, um, when Elliot was arrested, um, and you know, learned about the arrest. I, my original thing, learning about the arrest, was a Google alert that um, was uh, was because I would had an alert coming coming up for Aurora and Seattle. And um it was extremely disturbing. It was just really disturbing to read the police reports and everything like that about what he ended up um what he was doing um behind closed doors with um with with people and um 
let me make sure that I'm answering your full. I think I might, uh, can you just re ask me that one more time? <laughs> so. Yeah, I was just, um, you know, the first part of my question was asking what you learned about the crimes of Elliot during production. And then I think the second half of the question was um, just how, how the girls reacted and how this turned into more of a uh, story about almost justice in a way mm -hmm. uh, of telling their stories yeah so we continued you know we followed up of course with after he you know because he was in he was in jail for a good couple of years before he was even sentenced so we were continuing to follow up with um with their stories and their journey and um processing everything that had happened because he was kind of different a different thing to each person but um you know to christine he was like a best friend you know and so it was very hard for her to accept that and process it and everything and then to krista krista ends up you know she's dealing she continues dealing with her own you know um struggles you know with trauma and addiction after his arrest but she kind of takes things into her own hands and becomes it's kind of interesting she becomes a detective when his big thing was you know he thought he was Sherlock Holmes and he wanted to be a detective and she kind of becomes a detective to investigate him and um she really um you know not to use a little bit of a corny phrase you know took back her power maybe that's not corny but um you know, she, and then she speaks out, she speaks that she normally in a courtroom, um, you don't see victim impact statements a lot of the time being, um, uh, recorded, but there was, you know, there was press there and stuff like that. And we were there and she wanted it to be, she wanted it to be known and she gets to speak right to his face right there. And then the judge brings on another <laughs> layer of uh, the judge was really excellent. So um, that was really powerful. And so, um, yeah, so we just kind of get to see everyone reflecting after, you know, the arrest and everything. Some of that in voiceover and some of it in um, uh, interview. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think one of the ladies mentions um, something about the, his phone being, his uh, camera being like a contacts list, um, I well, believe yeah. is the quote. Yeah. When Krista, you know, went to the police station and they showed her the his phone, just, it was just full of hundreds of videos and whatever. So, um, yeah, those, I realize that a lot of people are not going to have seen the film, but, you know, hopefully yeah. maybe some people will watch after, um, watch this after <laughs> seeing it. Yeah. And I hope people do. If you're, if you're coming, um, from after watching the film, I'd, I'd love, uh, since this is on YouTube, there's a lovely comments section down below. Let me know what you thought of the film down below. Um, <laughs> And uh, I wanted to ask, I know, I know you sold out uh, on your encore screening, uh, which congratulations, by the way, uh, for Slamdance uh, oh, on the 24th. Yeah, I'm not, I don't even, I'm not even sure if it was or not. It was a little confusing. <laughs> with the, with well, the yeah, screen. it's, thank you. Yeah, it, 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 it is kind of weird because you've got a physical and a virtual. So it's like, what is okay. selling out? So, um, so yeah. yeah. Um, we will have so, we do have a little more virtual coming up um okay good yeah, yeah. i was just gonna ask what uh screenings you guys have coming up yeah we don't um as far as this festival um we have and this is only available in certain areas just because um so in utah washington and oregon you can still see it through slam dance channel mm -hmm. um through the 29th and then um, we're not entirely sure what our next, we have some offers from festivals, but we have to um, decide what we're going to do next. So 
the best way to keep up with that is we have um, on Instagram and Facebook, it's um, Sweetheart Deal Movie. So, mm -hmm. and then on Twitter, it's Sweetheart Docu, which, um, yeah, so we, and we also have um, SweetheartDealMovie.com is our website. So we'll, yeah. we'll be keeping that updated with um, up, upcoming screenings and anything with distribution. Yeah, and I'll have um I'll have that link in the description so that everyone can keep up to date oh, with cool. the film. Um and um if I may give a recommendation um for upcoming screenings, I I know um after the Spirit Awards, um typically film independent doesn't do a lot of screenings. So maybe I don't know if you can work out something with film independent. Um you might want to do an online screening with them. Oh yeah, I, I love them. Independent. I love they. We did a um, some kind of uh, not fellow something like a fellowship um, uh, a couple years ago, and they're they're really cool. So I uh, I would love to. <laughs> I'm up for it. So yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, because I I feel like after Spirit Awards, after you're watching like thirty films or something like that. Uh, from the screening uh, nominees, it's like yeah. kind of dead until like March, so that would be. I, um, in fact, I think uh one of the Oscar nominated films like maybe it was in October when they screened it. I was thinking January or maybe that was Little Fish last year. That's what it was. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, um, or um, I would love to do that. I I um. I'm not exactly sure how it works with, I think it's like festivals and then distribution. And then maybe we would be able to do something like that. But um, I don't know. I'm open to ideas. If anyone, if anyone would like to screen it. Yeah. Yeah. And if there are any, any um, people who um, maybe uh, are in control of those things, watching this on YouTube, uh, reach out and I'll get you in contact with uh, the, the folks uh, with a uh, sweetheart deal. Um, even if it's, um, yeah, it, like if it's distribution, what, um, whatever, I'll, I'll get you guys in contact with each other. Cool. Thanks Austin. Yeah. And, um, thank you for the interview. It's, it, it's always great to talk about documentaries. Yeah. It was fun to talk to you. Yeah. I can, I can tell you really, um, you know, I can tell when people really, you know, got the movie. And so uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Well, uh, I'm going to go eat lunch. Uh, you have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.